Thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again. And uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me back. Um, this, um, when I first thought about this, this talk, I was going to um, talk about the, this sort of kernels after um, after the, the 2006 paper, um, the work that Eric did and the paper that he and I did together. Um, and I, I'm going to take that in a different direction. Um, what I want to do is uh, look at the questions for which kernels were the answer. Um, so in a sense, I'm going to take a historical approach to ask, why is it that, or why was it, that Eric um, hooked, sort of not, well, almost fixated upon these particular gene regulatory structures that he found within strongholds of Centrodus as an explanation for this um, evolutionary body plan question, which has interested people for for quite a number of decades. Um, and then I'll sort of uh, shift from that to the related questions that come up um, with the evolution of novelty um, and try and suggest that there are some problems with how we've thought about some of the issues of novelty, which have come up repeatedly through this course. And there's actually, um, as I get to the end of this talk, there's a connection between um, some of the ways I look at novelty and some of the evidence that, and the discussions that Joe just presented. So, um, the classic body plan question is what happened 560 million years ago, 540 million years ago, um, with the, the origin of animals between the Ediac and the Cambrian, um, which Oyl talked about yesterday. These are some examples of the fossils we have at the bottom from the Bruton Shale, um, in the middle from the Changjiang fauna in China, in the Lower Cambrian, and then up at the top. Um, a variety of things from Ediacaran immediately before the Cambrian, um, all of which document um, this transition. The, the problem with body plans is that um, they're really a pre evolutionary concept, and they're certainly a pre phylogenetic concept. And they, the idea, the term has been repurposed repeatedly as evolution has moved on without really the concept moving on in many ways. This is um, a British ale animal described by Jean-Bernard Caron a number of years ago called Repetigaster, which he believes to be an ambulacrin. Um, you can see it's got these big animal respiratory structures um, and a pedicle that attaches to the, um, to the sediment. It's certainly a, an unusual organism. Um, quite what it is is still uh, a little unclear. But typical of many of these Cambrian organisms, um, once the, the first fossils are discovered, there's usually a long period of debate about the exact nature of the characters and where they fit in phylogenetically. So if you look just at, at the kinderms in deference to Derek Davidson, but the, the same pattern occurs with most of the two and clades. What we see in the fossil record is a very rapid, um, almost sudden appearance of the major different clades of these groups, whether it's echinoderms, arthropods, or whatever. Um, this shows uh, the appearance of, of a number of different echinoderm groups in the lower part of the Paleozoic. There's a new um, a wonderful new review that will be coming out later this year in biological reviews looking at uh, the evolution of these groups that was done, led by one of my former postdocs and the other young people at the, the work on echinoderms at the museum um, that provides more detail about this pattern. But this is the same sort of thing that we see repeatedly. And it's led to a lot of questions about um, why is it that these body plans seem to appear so, so quickly? And on the right here, you see a figure from a paper we published in the data from 2011 um, showing 
classes in phyla, whatever those sort of things are, um, that rapidly occur in the, the lower part of the Cambrian, the phyla in blue, and the, the classes and class-like architectures in, uh, in yellow. Uh, and one of the major changes since this work was published in 2013 is that the only phyla, the only classically recognized phylum, um, which is durably skeletonized and didn't appear in the Cambrian of rhizomes, those of you who care about rhizomes, which is a vanishingly small part of the world population, um, doesn't in fact include me, will know that rhizomes are now known from the lower Cambrian as well. So all of the, the phyla appear or believed to appear within the Cambrian. What that means is unclear. Um, because molecular clock data, which I won't go into here, suggests that most of these divergences happened well before the base of the So what the fossil record is in fact showing us is the appearance of large bodied skeleton, in most cases skeletonized structures um, that are sufficiently robust to appear in the fossil record. Not necessarily the origin of clades and not necessarily the origin of many of the characteristic attributes of these different groups. So the body plan problem, we can sort of decompose into a bunch of different questions, one of which is, what are the origin of the characteristic architectures that we see? And the second, um, which I think has become tightly related to it in a lot of the discussions, is why are these architectures stable over apparently hundreds of millions of years? You know, why are arthropods arthropods in the Cambrian and arthropods today instead of drifting off and becoming mollusks or something useful. Um, and Eric's answer to this question, um, Eric's attempt to answer this question, I think, uh, informs um, his use of this, the kernel concept derived from the structure of the gene regulatory network um, and strongholds and protists. I'm not suggesting that the kernels weren't there. I'm suggesting that um, how we conceived of them in 2006 needs to be understood in light of the purpose to which they were being put, which was not simply to understand the gene regulatory network of strongholds and protists today, but in light of these other questions about how body plants arose and how they can become stable for such a long period of time. So you've seen this figure before. Um, this is the gene regulatory, the wiring diagram um, for the first 30 hours. I think this is the, the 2005 edition. Um, there are a number of different editions. One of the things that um, is significant about these wiring diagrams is that there's a suggestion, and this is another one from work on, on uh, oh, this is the heart diagram for Drosophila, the vertebrate in the top two, showing a common um, gene regulatory network, uh, presumably a kernel for heart development um, in the lower part of the figure. And these structures um, were believed to have a number of attributes particularly the fact that they're crucially wired, which um, stabilizes the expression of the network, um, both developmentally and evolutionarily. Um, if they're crucially wired in this fashion, they're going to be resistant to further map modification, um, suggesting that evolutionary change is going to come. It will be upstream and downstream of uh, the kernel, much like the, um, the phylogenetic stage that we heard about in the first talk yesterday from, from Nancy Wolf. Um, so rather than dealing with the conservation of an entire body type, this kernel structure purportedly uh, advances the conservation of a component of the body type. And the claim is that these things should be stable across clades or across larger clades, whether the, the kernel is shared 
for example, across monotherians or across echinoderms, across duosomes, uh, which was an experimental question. Um, there were a number of other claims here, um, which I'll come back to in some of the other later slides. One of them in the middle is that the kernels are dedicated to development and are not going to be used elsewhere. Um, there was a claim in the 2006 paper that the interference with the function of any gene because of this recursive wiring diagram will destroy kernel function. So that the selection acts upon the kernel as a whole rather than any component of the kernel. The question is, how many kernels are there? Um, the, the hope, I think, in 2006 was that kernels would turn out to be at the base of regional patterning systems in a variety of different claims. That's not really what happened. Um, at least that's not what seems to have happened. There are examples of other putative kernels which have been described, many of them having to do, again, with mesoderm specification um, or endoderm. These are um, four recent examples of papers which invoke kernels explicitly in their des description of the gene regulatory network. Um, the one I particularly like is the, the plant stress response to, to salt that came out in nature plants about two years ago. Um, but these have the same recursively wired structures that you see in, um, in a kernel for uh, procedures. This is a recent paper from Nature Communications from um, Veronica Hinman's lab. Again, comparing the, the CO2 to the Starfish GRN. And in this case, um, it, it's a really interesting paper for me in detail because, on the one hand, Veronica and her colleagues extend the idea of kernels from the mesoderm kernel in the middle, which you see there, to the salomic kernel, um, an endoderm kernel, non mesenchyme kernel. Yet they also point out that these kernels are reused. So it violates the assumptions that were part of the original claim made in 2006. Um, one of the difficulties with the, the um, kernel concept comes back to that discussion of homology that we heard from Arla yesterday and the issue of where homology actually lies and what's conserved in these structures. So, when Eric and I were doing this work in 2005 and 2006, we did not deal with concepts of novelty explicitly. We did not deal or concern ourselves greatly with concepts of, of homology. Um, that wasn't sort of the problem agenda at that time. Um, as I'm going to show you in a minute, that's explicitly the, the problem agenda of another group who's, who's, who identified very similar structures associated with cell type development. So um, at the same time, you have different groups looking at similar gene regulatory structures, but asking very different questions and coming to different conclusions as a consequence. One of the things that um, is almost inherent in any structure, in any evolutionary network is the possibility of neutral network structures so that the, the network can be, can change perhaps significantly without actually changing the output. And in fact, many gene, as most of you all do will know, um, many gene regulatory networks uh, can be very labile at the network structure yet produce the same output developmentally and morphologically. That often is the case because you have the have a large neutral network, which are the light green parts of this network, um, in which you can have a single change within the structure of the network, um, which still produces the same output. And the size of those neutral nets can, in fact, be huge. So one of the things that Walter Fontana and Richard Wagner and Peter Stauber did when they were young in the early 19, or late 1990s, early 2000s, is look at the, the mathematical nature of these networks in tRNA and show that, in fact, you can go a long way in a neutral network to completely different structures um, with no need for selection. 
but these are, it's not constrained to to um, TRA structures at all. Peter Wainwright has shown that if you look at the jaw structures of fish, you can have structures that look very different, but in fact there's a neutral network that connects all the different jaw structures within these labyrinthodon fishes. Um, and uh, although if you simply looked at the, the skulls, you would say, well, there's clearly um, a selective reason for these different jaw structures. If you understand the dynamics of the jaws, you realize that there are simply components of one of these neutral networks. So and these networks can be widespread, including in, in gene regulatory networks as well. Most of the work on developmental system drift in GRNs has been done in, in C. elegans by Eric Haig uh, and his colleagues. So that leads to these sort of problems about about live plans and about GRNs, but the other way of conceiving them is to look at the, at the evolution novelty. In a sense, it's the same set of questions posed in a different fashion. Um, and that's what Gunter Wagner has done. Before I go there, let me just mention that, that part of the problem with body plans is that they're, um, they make no sense in a phylogenetic context um, because they're a mishmash of, of a variety of different features. They've been described as phyla, or as architectures of phyla, but they're not, to the extent that they're built, they're not necessarily limited to phyla, because phyla are a, a human construct anyway. Um, body plants may exist, if you want to relate them to the linear structures, they may exist at the class level or, or the super phyla level. Um, they're not the same thing as the last common ancestor the plague, which has a specific set of, of features whereas bioplanes um, include uh, synapomorphies as well as rhizomorphies and other structures. Um, they're not the same thing as a clinic specific phylotypic stage either, um, nor are they a modern day example of Owen's archetype. Um, they're, they're metaphorical in the same sense I think that the archetype is, but they have some differences from that structure as well. They've also been, um, so when Eric and I published the 2006 paper, uh, a noted biologist at the University of Chicago um, <laughs> with the initials JC, <laughs> but who will remain nameless, uh, wrote in complaining about our, our use of the term body plant. We hadn't actually used the term body plant in the paper. <laughs> it didn't even appear in the paper. So we wrote to science saying, we didn't even use the term body plan, um, but they published his, his, his comment anyway. Um, and there are a variety of different explanations that have been proposed. Um, so in 2006, Gunter Wagner at Yale publishes an idea for um, the origins of evolution and novelty and the source of new newly individuated homologous structures. And he identifies something that he calls a chin, a character identity network, um, as, the, sor as the, the basis for newly individuated homologous characters. His chins have this, exactly the same topological structure as kernels. They're a recursively wired network that locks down gene expression into a particular pattern. Gunter was concerned with the origin of new cell types, particularly the origin of new placental cells, rather than mutual patterning. But there's a clear, there's an obvious homology um, between the two structures. Um, in Gunter's book in 2014, he says they're not the same thing at all. But that's not true. Um, <laughs> my, my, Student, my former student, So Tweet, actually took an hour when he was at Maryland to sort of beat him at the submission to until Gunter finally admitted that in fact chains and kernels were, were similar structures. The, the, one of the, the, the critical things to grasp in the, this concept of character identity networks and homology is the difference between a character state 
um, and it, character identity. So character identity is the, the broader concepts, say all feathers, have the same character identity, even though the specific state that a feather may take from a flight feather to a body feather to downy under feathers differs considerably. And there may not be any obvious homologies between the endpoints of those different character states, but nonetheless, there's different instantiations of the same basic character. And um, the claim that Gunter and uh, Gerd Mueller and a number of his colleagues have made in papers since the 1990, or since 2000, is that um, the, the best definition of homology, uh, of novelty, lies in the, in the uh, identification of newly individuated homology, homologous characters, which Gunter claims are underlined by these, uh, these chants. And he goes into the great detail about this concept in his book in 2014, particularly the importance of individuality and quasi-independence um, of these novelties. And so this homology has been a, a key feature of Gunter's work throughout his career, and he has this, what he calls a reformed notion of homology, which um, features are developmentally individualized and derived from the same individualized body part in the most recent common ancestors of the two species, and it's underlain by this mechanistic model, um, which again is, is the same thing as a chromosome. And he has a number of, of examples of character identity networks, including the segment polarity network, which will get reused in a manner that's been promoted from, from a, a chin to a bippin. Um, I'll get there, I'll get there. So, with James DeFrisco and Al Love, um, this idea of character identity networks has been expanded um, to cell type character identity networks, tissues, organs, and actually the body plans. Um, in each case, the basic structure is the same, that there is a complex, um, the level of cells, of transcription factors and associated proteins with a particular structure that underlie, that mechanistically underlie the formation of these newly individuated structures. They suggest that tissue chins are underlain by cell-cell signaling pathways and then organs um, are defined as newly individuated structures because they have um, characteristic signaling centers um, which define the, the interactions between tissue types uh, and other associated cells. And the most recent um, example of this is a paper from earlier this year in um, seminars in cell development, uh, cell development biology. Um, there is a, a close connection between um, the ideas that they have developed and work that Detlet Art has done on the evolution of cell types, um, which is, this is a picture from Detlet's paper in 2008 in Nature Reviews Genetics on the divergence of um, photoreceptor cells across the animal kingdom into a variety of cell types and how uh, you can basically build, in his mind, uh, a, a um, bifurcating diagram of the divergence between different photoreceptors. Um, and that, so that cell types all arise from sister cell types. Yet in the last talk, if you cut that, of course, one of the points that Joe made is that he's got a new cell type that is not arising from a sister cell divergence model at all. It's in fact a combinatoric model for the cell type. It's a, it's a very different model of cell types. Um, there was a paper in 2016 that that led, uh, led that a number of people were on. And uh, at the meeting we had the San Jose Institute on cell types that led to that paper, um, a number of us actually came up with, in principle, four different ways of constructing new cell types. The sister cell type model and three alternatives. And um, there were several people at the meeting who 
we believed had evidence in favor of some of the alternatives to the cell type model. And the, uh, the paper that came out in 2016 is, is sort of like one of those diplomatic um, the missives that come out of some meeting of heads, and sta heads of state. Because you, you have to parse the words very carefully to realize that then half of the authors don't agree with the other half of the authors, <laughs> but that the, the two people who submitted the manuscript massaged the writing enough to, to keep the other authors on the paper while it, it's, it's a, it was an interesting paper to write. <laughs> um, because I, I think that this idea that a simple sister cell divergence model explains the origin of all cell types isn't supportable. But it certainly informed a lot of the ideas of how, how these chins and chins and all develop. Um, on the left here is some single cell RNA sequencing data from Hydra showing a number of different cell types. Um, the same, Detlin was really interested, of course, in the origin of neuronal cells. He took the basic data from this um, and showed how um, combinatorics of different transcription factors and other um, components will yield the different cell types that you see along the, the, the top. So this is the, the middle diagram is simply a reformulation of the data that was in the original Siebert et al. paper. Um, one of the, the key components to Detlev's view of cell types, which is why I bring, it all, bring this up, um, is this idea of a core regulatory complex. And if you look over here, the, these core regulatory complexes are self-sustaining networks. They're the, they're the same recursively wired network that you saw in kernels and in chins and in what Detlev calls um, CRCs. So informationally, they're, they're, they're thought to be the same thing. And I think what is under is underlying this is that that's the simplest structure that will maintain an expression pattern. It doesn't mean that's what's necessarily there, but it's the simplest way to conceive of the network that could be there. Um, this is a, a paper by Bonas et al. that just came out, it literally came out Sunday, I think, um, in PNAS, um, looking at the, at the evolution of metacytes, in this case, they identify a new zinc finger transcription factor, uh, ZNF845, which blocks RF amide and actually allows the, um, the generation of a, of a uh, new type of nitocyte. Um, it also involves a bunch of, there's some d domain shuffling and a few other things that are going on here. But this is another example of a new cell type that actually arises by, by repressing a pre-existing neuronal cell type. So a, a different means of getting to the same end, but in this case, one that doesn't require any recursively wired um, gene network structures. So I, I promised I would give you bipples or bipins whatever, however you want to pronounce, five plan identity mechanisms. This is the latest paper by DeFisco and Wagner in which they suggest that there are in fact mechanisms underlain by long vein signaling pathways within developing embryos um, that in fact, in their view, underlie the preservation architectures um, across body plants. So they now have this hierarchical structure of um, recursively wired regulatory or developmental interactions going from cells to tissues to organs to the entire body plan that um, they believe uh, explains the, the conservation of these characters. And the second part of the reason I wanted to put this back in is it comes back to the talk that Ariel gave yesterday because they use the segmentation patterning network that Oil described as one of the examples, in fact, what they believe 
is one of the best examples, along with the notochord, of one of these body plan um, identity mechanisms. <clears throat> one of the challenges, I think, to, there are a number of sort of ways you could go with interrogating this approach to gene regulatory evolution. Well, I think one of the questions that is unresolved by the work that um, Gunter and his colleagues have done is whether or not these networks are actually generating the novelty. Does the, does the network have to form in order for the morphological structure to form? Or are they stabilizing the, novel, the novelty? Um, in, a, in a phylogenetic sense, they clearly see the character identity me mechanisms and the morphological expression as occurring at the same point in the same node. Um, whether or not you can decompose that is, uh, is an issue that they don't, they don't seem to address. And for, for cell types, it sort of makes sense. I think um, the question arises more at the level of tissues and organs um, and certainly at the level of body plants. Um, part of the reason I raised this is that I think we have now a number of examples in which, um, without saying that they, the chins or curls or whatever are actually formed or later, um, components of the, develop, of the genetic or developmental patterning seem to arise in many cases well before the morphological novelties do. So the developmental capacity in, in a number of cases seems to precede um, the expression of that that we see morphologically. But let me first um, turn back to this issue of what we mean by novelty. Um, the, no the definition of novelty that's used by um, Gunter and his colleagues, I think the fifth one down there, the newly individuated homologous characters, but in fact, there were a whole, today there are a whole series of different approaches to evolutionary novelty. Um, part of, some of them, the ones at the top here, are a residue of the work by Simpson and Meyer and others in the modern synthesis and look at novelty as an equalot, as, an, as a utilization of ecological opportunity rather than a fundamentally a morphological or developmental process. And at the bottom here, we have this problem whether or not behavior actually precedes the morphological expression, which I think was the question that James asked after the last talk. Um, these, let me just, so one of the ways of looking at those different um, questions is to realize that in fact they're asking different questions. Some the, these different approaches to novelty differ strongly in whether or not they're looking at radically new structures, at whether they're looking at, at structures or um, clades that are generative of new taxa or are ecologically significant, um, which is what I call consequential. So you can actually divide these different approaches to novelty and innovation in terms of whether or not they're, they're, they're radical, generative, or consequential. And in the work that I've been doing on novelty and innovation, and I, I distinguish between those two, as those of you who were, were here in 2019 might remember, um, there's, um, I think it's impossible to truly understand the success of evolutionary novelties without looking at both the ecological and the developmental component. And too often, um, people ignore sort of half of this diagram. If you look at the work of Simpson and Meyer in particular, um, those on the top who, in my terms, are looking at innovation, they were assuming that variation would, explicitly, it's clear from the writing, they're assuming that variation will occur when an ecological opportunity presents itself. So you didn't need to worry about that. That'll happen. Whereas Gunter, not, I'm not trying to pick on Gunter, I actually like his work quite a bit, but 
many of the developmental approaches um, are interested in, in the origin of morphological and developmental novelties and don't concern themselves with how they succeed. And in fact, any um, more complete view of this process has to, has to consider both novelty and innovation, which is why I think we have to tear them apart and consider them independently. We can't combine the two, which I think is what's been done all too commonly. And I'll stop there. chapter in the 2015 book that you didn't write um, that was much more the evolutionary dynamics of, of networks as we knew them in 2015, much less how we know them now. Um, and I think because of the enhancer um, phenomenon, as well as a lot of what we know about chromosomal modeling and things like that, um, the solution to the question in 2005 it's not the same solution to the question that you would reach now. Um, so part of what I was trying to do is say that the, that the solution that both Gunter and um, Eric arrived at in 2015 reflected their knowledge of the gene regulatory networks in light of how they wanted to answer these other questions. But I, I don't think you need that structure to address the question. I, oh, oh, go somebody ahead. else? <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I would like to know what has remained from the 2016 kernel idea so far. And the second uh, idea of kernels. Um, and, uh, and the, oh, okay. Uh, the, so I mean, there are a number of people in the audience who will probably have a more informed opinion than I. Um, I. I think that that they remain a, a, a potential subsurrogate within gene regulatory networks that can accomplish a particular task. Um, the, the hypothesis that they're going to underlie um, or, or be fundamental to a lot of patterning systems I don't think has been borne out. I don't, I don't think that's... Has been what? I don't think that's been supported empirically. Um, and, and I think there are a broader variety of ways of um, ensuring the stability of gene expression than, than a recursively wired network. 
that's the most obvious solution to the problem, but it's not necessarily the, the one that biology has used. So what is then the reason for the stability of the body plants? Uh, I think that's still, to some extent, an open question. But I, but I, I don't think that Gunter's answer of a body plan individuating mechanism, um, which is, it has become an increasingly metaphorical concept as these papers have gone along, yes. that, I don't think that's the solution. No, I also it, don't. His, his solution is basically to say, in the, the 22 pa paper, what they essentially say is, body plans are a metaphor, and the, the mechanisms that produce them are also a metaphor. Therefore, they're equal. Well, I don't, <laughs> that, I don't think that's very, really, that may be unfair to James and, and, um, and Guntram, but I think it's essentially the, the conclusion that they arrive at. And I don't think that's a solution to the problem. No, but in any case, it must be something related to the networks. I mean, because it, they have been I, inherited I, for so long. I, I think it's certainly true, but I think the solution to the problem is to reformulate it away from body plans um, and to focus on, as we have in this meeting, to focus on the origin of cell types, the origin of tissues, the origin of, of organs and how they interact, rather than this sort of movie base of, of body plans. But if you also include how they interact, you get up to something bigger than cell types. Mm -hmm. But you also have a problem that, that is more practical. I mean, look, one of the, the beautiful things about what Joe showed in his work is how if you um, focus at a much more recent time depth in the Cambrian um, and utilize a system like that, it's a much more tractable system um, in which to, to understand the origin of these new cell types and the other things that, that, that he's, he's interested in. Um, I think that the problem of this of stability um, within what we call body plans is still an interesting problem, but it may be, in a sense, an upward um, expression of stability that's happening um, within complexes that we can really understand. In other words, I'm not sure that that posing the question as a a question of body plan stability is a usefully posed question. I, mean, I think you sort of already asked the, answered the question I was going to ask, but it is, so these bit ends, I mean, they appear to sort of hark back to the idea of a morphogenetic field in yeah. many ways. And so is there anything new in that that, that we haven't? Is it just reformulating the idea with new language? Uh, I, I think. Gunter, to be fair to, to Gunter and James, I think they would argue that um, that it's not simply invoking morphogenetic fields, that, that, that they, there is empirical evidence for long-range signaling pathways that um, are a useful instantiation of what they're looking at. Um, I'm not as convinced that um, that they've sort of cashed that claim out, at least in this paper. And to um, me, it sort of raises the question of, I think you've already said this, right, but are we, are we trying to see you know, um, you know, conceptual structure and hierarchy where there isn't any? I mean, yeah, I, I am increasingly worried that that is the case. That's why, in, in my response to this question, I, 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 I guess I no longer think that the body plan question is a scientifically useful question. But, uh, do, do you want to explain the, the body plan by an emergence of, of cells? No, I, I think we, we, we explain it um, historically and in the context of phylogenetic clades and looking at the origin of, of novelties within clades. But those those novelties, those characters, are attributes of an organism rather than being a the sort of all-encompassing 
concept um, that I think is more an emergent phenomenon than something that's really practical. Which I realize that you will not find convincing. No, I don't. <laughs> so my, you know, my advisor Jim Valentine published his magnum opus in 2004 called The Origin of Body Plants, which was an homage to the origin of species, but the, or the origin of phyllos in the other way. And phyllo were body plants for Jim. But I, I think it's increasingly apparent that the idea of body plants has probably run its course. I think we can understand, I think it's, it's a more tractable research program um, to understand whether it's the Cambrian or rose beetles is to look at uh, components, whether it's cell types, tissue types, organs, the interrelationship between them and how the the embryo is built, those are practical problems. As opposed to what James and uh, DeFrisco and, and Guter done in this last paper, what my advisor tried to do in 2004, and explain you know, body plans, this, this sort of amorphous metaphorical concept as a whole. That doesn't, that, I guess it no longer strikes me as a, a paleo research program. So, in the interest of time, we will continue this series later on in the evening. And I would like to invite our last speaker, Andrew German. Uh,